to us. Amen? Yes. Amen. Uh, well, this morning, we have a new song for you guys. Uh, and this, this song is straight out of uh, 2 Chronicles 20. 
And I wanted to share this story with you guys today. Um, it's one that I had never heard before, but it really struck a chord in me. Um, and you're gonna have to bear with me because it is an Old Testament story. So there's lots of funny names. <laughs> so y'all give me some grace here. Uh, but this story begins with King Jehoshaphat. And he receives words that the Moabites and the Ammonites are coming to attack his people. And he immediately declares a fast and a prayer across all the nation. And all the people come together. And as they begin to pray, the scripture tells us that the spirit came upon a Levite man. And in verse 17, he says, you will not need to fight this battle. Mm -mm. <laughs> Stand firm, hold your position, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. Amen. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them, and the Lord will be with you. And the next day, it says, the king, he appointed singers and worshipers in holy clothing. He didn't send out the strongest army to the front lines. No, no, he sent out worshipers to the front lines. Amen. And as they go out, the scripture tells us that their enemies, when they saw them singing and praising, they were routed, meaning that they literally turned against each other, <laughs> right? It's crazy. And the Lord fought that battle and he won that battle for them. And all they had to do is sing and give praise to their God. Our God still fights our battles for us today. He hasn't abandoned us. He's with us on the front lines and we're gonna worship him today for that. Let's give him glory in this place together. Come on church, sing this out with us.
sing this together, church. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare your living hope. Your presence, Lord. Yes, Jesus. I've tasted. The sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come for
to those that used to go to the 9.30 service and used to go to the 11 o'clock service. This is crazy. Like, this is awesome. And so welcome to summer at West Cobb Church. Uh, man, you guys could be seated. We are so excited that you guys are here. And, and uh, man, singing songs, it's much more than singing songs. And we can sing songs about how good God is and those can just be words, but let me tell you how good God is, because God is still moving, God is still working, God is still changing lives, and there's, uh, there's power in prayer, because I believe prayer is the difference. It's the difference from what I could do and the difference from what God can do, and, and we have something special about how God is working today. Um, we have an individual, Noah, uh, he right here uh, was in an ATV accident about a month or so ago, and uh, doctors didn't even know if you were going to make it or walk, bro. And you are a living testimony of how God is still moving. And I, man, I just want to tell you that there's been tons of people that have come alongside of you and your family and just the battles Jesus is. And, and we're so glad for what God's doing in your life. So thank you for being here. It's more of a testimony to us as a body than it is probably to you right now. And so, man, God is so good and we're excited for what God's gonna do. Uh, I also wanna say thank you so much for your generosity towards our church and the mission of who we are. As we head into the summer, without your sacrificial giving and generosity, we can't do what we're going to do this summer. And so we're excited. We're pumped for what God's going to do starting today. And so you can continue to give towards wccgive.com. We have drop boxes that are at the back of the room as you leave, or you can give traditionally, however you like uh, uh, to do. But we greatly appreciate you guys giving uh, because we believe the next is going to be so cool. And, and, and we're going to give all the glory to God. Um, I know it's a, it's a packed house today. And so whether you come to the 9.30 service, 11 o'clock service, uh, maybe this is your first time here, or maybe you're re-engaging back with us, we'd love to connect with you better. And so if you are a guest today, would you please take out your phone and text the word guest to the number that's on the screen. And not only um, is it a way just for us to follow up with you and hear your story and connect you guys with what God's doing this summer, 
but we also want to give you a $5 Starbucks gift card and just say thank you. Thank you for being here. And so I, I'm actually serious about this. And so if you're, if you're tuning in online or you're here in, pers here in person, this is your first time re-engaging back with us, please do us a favor, text the word guest to that number, fill out that connect card. We'd love to connect with you better, put a name with a face, but also buy your coffee tomorrow morning. All right, so uh, please do that. We have so many things going on uh, that we're doing in the summer. June 25th, we're having a men's gathering. Uh, man, our men are fired up about this. And so uh, this is just a great opportunity uh, for guys just to come together and just have community, connect, uh, enjoy some worship, some amazing food, catering in some barbecue, having some games, uh, and this is just going to be a great opportunity, not for you to get engaged, but for you to invite a coworker, a friend, um, whatever that looks like. So June 25th, we're going to have more information to pass out to you guys and share with you guys in the, in the few weeks to come. But put that date on your calendar, guys. Yeah. Wives, elbow your husbands right now. June 25th, that's not an event that you want to miss, guys. I promise you that, all right? Now, I'm going to give you a fair warning. In about 10 to 15 minutes, David, I apologize in advance, you're going to smell a lot of good food. And everybody knows what happens when people get hangry, all right? So we have an incredible lunch following this service. And so we want everyone to stay. We have food for every single person. And it's uh, amazing food. Um, you know, food is on us, connection, community. We'd love to connect with you guys, talk with you guys, just do life together. That's our theme throughout the whole summer. We have activities and food for kids and preschool students. So no pressure on anything for your family. In fact, kids, we're having a Nerf war in the kids' room. And so let me tell you, it's on like Donkey Kong, all right? So everything is planned for you guys. And so following the service, everything's gonna be in the lobby. We love to just um, connect and, and enjoy each other's company just for a few, few uh, maybe an hour at most. But everything is on us. And so uh, we're excited for that, excited for the summer. And today, we're kicking off our summer series called It Matters. Why does church matter? Why does what we do matter? And uh, I'm pumped for that, but I'm gonna, before I pray and we, we get into um, the, the, the kickoff of our summer series, a few weeks ago, um, we, we, uh, we, we, we had David Camp come up on stage and, and, and David, I just wanna tell you from me individually and from our family, how much you mean to us and how much you mean to this church body. And uh, I am thankful for you to be our interim pastor and lead us into a time as this. And so I'm gonna pray for us as a church and excited for you to bring God's word this morning. Father, we love you. We're thankful that you fight our battles. And so many times we like to have control over the situation instead of just giving it to you. God, we're thankful that you're still working you're still moving and you're still speaking. The power is in your name. And God, we can have everything orchestrated, everything planned, but just like we sang, if your spirit does not come into this place and move, then we're doing everything in vain. And so God, I pray that right now for every single person, whether you've been coming for months, you're, you're re-engaging back, um, in person, or maybe this is your first time here today, or maybe you're tuning in online. God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts in such a new and powerful way that your spirit is all over this place. God, you are welcome here. God, I pray that you move in such a way that when we leave this, this room, when we leave these doors, that we are a light into a dark world. We are salt 
And God, I pray that you would continue to bless and pour into West Cobb Church. God, I pray that you would speak through David Camp today. God, that his words will be from you and not of flesh. And I pray that you change lives in this place today because you are a God that changes lives. We love you and we pray this in your name. Amen. Morning, good morning. Man, this is great to see all of you here with us this morning. And I'm excited about diving into this series called It Matters here with you throughout the summer. And, uh, you know, as I look around here today, uh, I, I see some old friends and I see some familiar faces. Um, in fact, some of you have met. Uh, my buddy David, who's to my left, um, and he's sitting over there with my brother and, and, uh, and his brother, and we like have known each other and went to church together for years and years and years. In fact, I shared with you guys uh, the story of his dad and how he used to lead music and the meaning that that had on my life spiritually. I see some other people here today that, uh, that have, that have that are here this morning, who've been coming, who actually were a part of a church start uh, that we did back in 1993 over in the Osborne High School community. And it makes me think about this. When I see those faces, you know what? It makes me remember the power and the impact and the influence that the church had in my own life. The people of the congregation that have been a part of my life since I was a small child and throughout my life as I grew into a middle-aged man. And sometimes it's very easy for us to decide that we are going to go about life alone, that we're going to do sort of our own thing and that we don't need anyone. But as I look at those past relationships and I look at those people that are here with, with us today, it reminds me of how important the body of Christ is and that it matters. What we do together in life, in our pursuit of the person of Jesus Christ, it matters. And so we're going to start off our series throughout the summer titled It Matters in looking at the book of 2 Corinthians. And if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn there with me, the book of 2 Corinthians. Now today's going to be a little different in that I'm gonna give you a broad survey of the book of 2 Corinthians, and we're gonna be in several verses of scripture because in order for us to really glean from God's word what he needs to say in our lives, we need to understand the full context of 2 Corinthians and specifically what the apostle Paul is dealing with as he communicates to the church at Corinth. You know, there was a great theologian, musician, philosopher, and a Nobel Prize winner. He was a physician, and his name was Albert Schweitzer. And he was revered, very much a revered man, but yet later on in his life, there were certain flaws that began to emerge. And this man who was known as a great philosopher, a great thinker, a great leader, had moral compromise that entered into his personal life, yet, History over time has tended to overlook those flaws. And Albert Schweitzer said these words. He says, a man does not have to be an angel to be a saint. 
A man does not have to be an angel to be a saint. And when we look at the book of 2 Corinthians and we look specifically at the individual of Paul, this is true of his life. Paul was a man that did not have to be an angel in order to be a saint. And the apostle Paul is writing to the Corinthian church and he's trying to stress a very important point. There is division, there's chaos, and there's some misdirection going on. And the people of God have lost relationship. They're no longer connected. And they've lost their way. And they've been led astray by a group of people that were known as the super apostles. You know, these were the hot preachers of the day. And they were charismatic. People loved listening to them. And these super apostles were coming up and they were saying, Paul is boring, he's monotone, he's a bad speaker, he's old. Guys, why are you listening to him? This is the new way. But the new way, that it was leading people astray because they were moving away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And instead of elevating the cross, the grace that we find in the person of Jesus Christ, they were elevating man. They were elevating the talent of man. They were elevating everything that was good about man as opposed to what was good about God. And see, Churches lose their way when it becomes elevation of man as opposed to elevation of God. And in our celebration, in our celebration that we've had here this morning, we focus in our worship on the goodness and the greatness of the God that we serve. And see, we find more in our relationship with Jesus Christ. We discover more the power of God in our lives when the focus is not on who we are, what we can do, and what we are capable of, but the focus is on our God, what he can do, and what he is capable of. And when that happens, you see God move in extraordinary ways, in ways that cannot be, sub, that cannot be uh, a, a, an event that can be explained by man, but it can only be something where we see the God and the, and the live God and the powerful God that we serve on a day out and a day, a day in and a day out basis. And so Paul, he's facing this struggle. He's dealing with that church that has lost its way. And they begin to attack Paul. They literally begin to attack Paul. These super apostles launch an attack on the apostle Paul. And so Paul is disturbed by this and he pens a series of letters. Second Corinthians isn't just one continuous letter, it's actually multiple letters that the apostle Paul writes. And he starts out and he says this. He says, I want you to know this. He describes himself as, in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, he says, I am the least of the apostles. Then he says in Ephesians 3, 8, that I am the very least of all saints. And in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, he says, I'm the chief or the foremost of all sinners. So when Paul enters into this communication with the church at Corinth, he's trying to say, listen, we, have, we are misdirected, we have lost our way, we have lost our focus, and what I need you to understand is being in right relationship with each other and being in right relationship with God, it matters because what we do together is a direct reflection of the power of the God that we serve. And in 2 Corinthians, we see Paul's passion and we see his vision specifically for the church of Jesus Christ. So today, we're going to do a survey of 2 Corinthians, and we're going to set the table because what Paul understood was this. Paul understood the need for a healthy ministry in the lives of people and in the community of which Corinth was a part, and he clearly communicates it matters. So today, when you woke up and you made the decision to come here, it matters. 
today, when you woke up and you made the decision that you were going to say, I will be a part of West Cobb Church, every single person in this room, it matters. Why? Because there is a life that only you can touch. There is an individual that you can be the difference maker in their life because through you, they can see Jesus in a way that they can't see Jesus necessarily through me. Every single person in this room has a role to play. Every single person in this room has a gift to give. And the Apostle Paul said this, Our relationship, it matters. The message of the cross, that's what matters. And our place in the kingdom of God, it matters. So as you look at this letter, it is personal to Paul. You know, sometimes, has someone ever come to you and they started to criticize you and you got a little defensive? Hmm? Paul's defensive. Paul's just a bit defensive in this moment as these super apostles come against him, and as these super apostles attack, he starts to reveal something about where he is at. Paul is actually in pain, and he he begins to describe that hurt. He is very transparent, and he he begins to reveal, he says, listen guys, in my walk with God, I've experienced great pain along with great joy. In my walk with God, I've experienced great outrage and I've experienced suffering. But I've also seen and experienced the love of God and the conviction of God. And when you read this letter and you truly go deep into this letter, you see that the Apostle Paul has a heart that is breaking. It is breaking because his leadership is being called into question. The gospel of Jesus Christ is being called into question. And the people of God have lost their way. And he says to them, he says, I see the misdirection. I know that this is a body that is losing its way. And Paul was frustrated because he could not seem to change the tide. He did not seem to have enough influence to change the momentum that was actually taking place where the church was no longer fulfilling its purpose in its community of Corinth. In fact, Paul became a man of great status that was losing ground with the church at Corinth that was losing its way. And this once revered leader is facing a people's majority that arm in arm, lockstep, they're choosing to go in a different direction. And I want you to look in 2 Corinthians chapter one, I want you to read with me verses eight through 11. 2 Corinthians chapter one, verses eight through 11. Paul writes, We do not want you to be uniform, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. So he's saying, look, I don't want you to be uninformed about the fact that we have suffered, that we have endured. He's being open. In verse 9, he says, indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. We thought that that it was over for us, but this happened, that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him, we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. As you help us by your prayers, then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. So the Apostle Paul opens up and he says, listen, I am in despair. I have faced trouble. I've been doing the work of God, even to the point to where it almost cost me my life. And then he goes on and he says this, I am struggling, I am weary, but in God I trust. 
If you summarize that particular text, that's what you see. Paul says, listen, church, I'm weary, I'm struggling, but it is in God that I trust. So as Paul is facing this battle, as Paul speaks in his defense, he steps up and he says this, listen, guys, I am doing the work that God has called me to do to the point that it has cost me my life almost. And in the battles that I am facing, God continually reveals himself. And because he's continually revealing himself, I trust what he is doing. Don't give up on me and don't stray from what I'm saying. He goes on, look with me in chapter four, if you would. Chapter four. And I want you to read with me, starting in verse eight. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse eight. He then goes on and he says, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive and always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So when, he look, when you look at that particular text, one of the things that he points out is he uses the word perplexed in verse 8. The idea of perplexed specifically is without way. And the whole problem that Paul is dealing with as he fights this battle is he and the church are perplexed. They are without way. Paul is confused. And that word, that idea of per perplexed is that I am aimless and I don't quite know where to turn. I see the goodness of God. I see the struggles of life. I see the goodness of God. I see the struggles of life. And when we church have this conflict, Paul said, it puts me in a position where I am perplexed. I don't even know what to do next. Have you ever been a point in your life where you're just perplexed? You're lost? You're aimless? Have you ever been to that place in your life and you don't know specifically what to do? Well, that not only happens to us personally, but it can also happen to us collectively as a body. You know, I read an article of Forbes magazine, and they were talking about the number one reason that people hate their careers, their jobs. And they called it drift syndrome. Drift syndrome. Now, if I, and it's okay, right? We're gonna be transparent here today. You're, you're gonna see that as we get to where I'm going. How many of you hate your job? Raise your hand. You hate your job, okay? There, I see hands going up, okay? How many of you love your job? How many of you are just, yeah, I'm there. Okay, all right. So, so we have honesty here happening in this room today. And this idea of, of drift syndrome is that we can't really quite figure out what we want to do. We can't quite figure out why we're doing it. And we just sort of seem to have drifted in a job. Let me give you an example. When I started college, if I could not achieve being a professional baseball player, which did not happen, then, then I wanted to be a coach. So uh, I started out with the goal of I was going to coach. Well, then I decided to transfer and play baseball at another school. And at that school, they had, uh, they had engineering degrees. Okay, so I like to, I can do math, I'm good at it, but you know what? It, I would rather read, I'd rather go to history class, I would rather write. I like doing this stuff, right? That's what I like doing. Um, and so I made my, my decision about what was going to be my career or my major at that particular school by counting the number of math classes that were associated to the degree. <laughs> That's how I made my decision. And so I ended up with, so my plan was choose the easiest degree, play baseball, least amount of math, I'll get through it, 
then I'll go back, I'll get a teaching certification, I'll go coach and teach and do what I, what I wanted to do. Well, guess what happened? So I get the degree, and I start this job, and, I, and, I, and I, I'm a quality manager, and uh, Angela and I get married, and, uh, and I make the decision that, hey, I'm gonna go to Kennesaw, and I'm gonna start working on my certificate to become a teacher. And so I start that certificate, and I discover that Angela is pregnant. Then I discover that kids cost money. <laughs> then I discover, what does an engineer make? What does a teacher make? <laughs> I made my decision. I was gonna be an engineer, right? And I made that decision, I drifted into that. I didn't plan that. I drifted into that particular decision. And there's many of you here today that you probably have the very same story. And what Paul is challenging the church to do here is we don't want to drift. We don't want to be aimless in our personal spiritual lives. We don't want to be aimless as a body of Christ because when we do that, that means that people can't see the power of the living God that we serve. That means that people can't know and understand the grace of Jesus Christ. That means people can't experience the love of this one Jesus who died, who was buried, and resurrected on our behalf. We don't want to be aimless because what we do personally and collectively matters because we're pointing people to the one who can save our soul and change our life. Now, when that happens with us, we should be taking it seriously. When we allow our ministry to be aimless, when we allow ourselves to wonder, when we allow ourselves to go through the motion, we are doing a disservice to people because they can't see the great God that we know and that we love. What we do here, it matters. But what I find is this. When the body of Christ and when people begin to aimlessly wander spiritually, some people just accept that, uh, whatever. I just accept it. I'm cool with it. Whatever. I'll just, I'm going to go through the motions. This is tradition. We've been doing this all of our lives. I'm just going to go through the motions. Then there's others who say, I'm going to face it. No, I'm going to be real about where I'm at spiritually. I'm going to be real about where our church is at spiritually. I'm going to be real about the direction that my life is going. And they're going to face it. And as they face it, then there's a decision to fix it. Now, a lot of people struggle between face it and fix it. Why? Because when you decide to fix it, that means that you are deciding to be committed. In your own spiritual life, if you are wondering aimlessly, where are you? Are you at the place of accepting it? Are you at the place of facing it? Or are you at the place of fixing it? What we need to do if we really want to see God act and move through this body of Christ individually, we need to say no to accepting it, we need to say yes to facing it, and we need to say yes to fixing it, right? We here have decided that we want to be a part of the local body of West Cobb Church. And as a part of the local body of West Cobb Church, I don't want to be a bystander st sitting up in the stands just watching the action. I want to be a player that's not just on the bench wearing the jersey. I actually want to be on the field playing, right? I want the ball in my hand. That's the attitude that we need to have if God is going to do what God can do and what God is capable of in the lives of the people here in this body and the community of which we are a part. Now, as Paul goes on throughout the scripture, I want to highlight for you four truths that surface that we're going to dive into. Now, I'm going to hit these relatively quickly, but we're going to be diving into these deeply over the coming weeks. The first thing in the passage that we just read in 2 Corinthians chapter four, what we see is this, people of God are not immune to difficulty. People of God 
are not immune to difficulty. Now, I, I talked about this a few weeks ago, so I'm not gonna harp on it further, but this idea that somehow you become a believer and everything in your life lines up is a lie, right? It is not true. Every single one of us, if you are in this room today and you've been a believer for an extended period of time, raise your hand if you've had trouble in your life. Okay, all the hands go up. Raise your hand if you ever lost a job. Raise your hand if you were ever sick. Raise your hand if you ever had a financial difficulty, right? All of us in this room have experienced difficulty. We are not immune to it. The second thing is this. People of God experience the tensions and the contradictions of life. If you look there in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 specifically, when, ta- when Paul talks about, I'm hard pressed on every side, but I'm not crushed. I'm perplexed, but I'm not in despair. I am persecuted, but I haven't been abandoned. I am struck down, but guess what? I'm not destroyed. Right, those are contradictions in life. And he does the same thing in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter six, verses three through 10. You can read it there. But Paul talks about these contradictions that he will deal with. He even says, look, some people give a good report about me and some people give a bad report about me. Paul was dealing with the highs and the lows, the struggles and the joys of life. And he, you know, some of us go into our faith and we think that because I'm a believer and everything's gonna be great in my life, that they get quickly disappointed when they find out that that is not the case, that somehow saying yes to Jesus is a magic pill that ensures that all I have in life is comfort, success, peace, possessions, car, you know, all that's good. And when it gets hard and life is tense and life is tough and life is unfair and people don't like you and people come against you and people don't agree with you, then our tendency is to go, I, 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 I quit. I can't do, I can't do this. But when we move forward in our faith to a great place of maturity, it is when we understand that there is tensions and contradictions as people of God in this life that we live. Here's the great thing about it. Life's tensions expose our weakness and draw us to God's power. The Apostle Paul in chapter 11, verses 23 through 27, you can note it, In chapter 12, verses 7 through 11, he says this, I went from prison to paradise. I went from darkness to life. I was frustrated, but what Paul learned to do is Paul learned to do this. I have a great old friend in ministry. His name is Bruce Hamrick. And I love this story that he shared many, many, many years ago, and I've never forgotten it. His son was, you know, maybe three years of age. And you know those building blocks that kids can sort of put together, right? You know what I'm talking about? So his, his son is putting together these building blocks and he's in the floor of the living room and he would get to a certain point and he's trying to stack these building blocks and they would fall over. And so he would do it all over again and suddenly the building blocks would fall over, and he watched his son get very frustrated at three years old over that experience. And Bruce allowed this to go on, to go on, and to go on, and then suddenly his three-year-old son goes, here, Daddy. Frustrated, could not build what he expected to build, it kept falling over, and then suddenly he, he goes, Here, Daddy. You know, that's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying this. 
You're going to experience frustration in, in your life. You're going to experience disappointment in your life. You're going to experience those people that come against you, those people that have something to say. You're going to experience the attack of Satan. He's going to do everything he can to defeat you and not allow you to push forward in your walk with God. And you know what? You're going to, like the apostle Paul, get frustrated. Paul was frustrated. Paul wasn't happy about this. Paul wasn't just joyful about this. Paul just considered this letter to be his most painful letter because he was being rejected by a, by a people that he had poured into for almost two years to help the church of Corinth get off the ground. And now they're saying no to him and yes to these super apostles. And he's frustrated. You're here today and you may be frustrated in your personal walk with God. You may be here today and God's not doing it the way that you would expect him to do it. God's not directing the way that you would expect him to direct. The outcome isn't the outcome that you would actually expect. And you're frustrated, you're frustrated, you're frustrated, you're frustrated. And what God is trying to say to you, just that, like that little child on the floor doing the building blocks that keep falling over and over and over again, what God is trying to say to us is, when will you just do this? Here, Daddy. Here, Daddy. How many of you are here today and you need to say, here, Daddy? You're trying to, you be, we had a lot of people that just graduated and, and you don't need to make, I'm not advocating that you make your degree selection like I did, right? <laughs> but you're, you're, trying to, you're trying to make that selection and you're struggling with it. I understand that. I don't discount that. And you need to go, you just need to go, here, Daddy. Trust God. There are some of you here today and you raise your hand that you're frustrated with your job and you don't know exactly what to do about it. There's just a moment where you need to go, here, daddy. There are some of you that are struggling in your marriage. You're struggling financially. You're struggling in relationship. You just need to go, here, daddy. Our church, West Cobb Church, have we experienced difficulty, decision, transition? But you know what? What we're doing here today is we're going, here, daddy. Here, daddy. You got, you got it. You got it. Because in that moment, he can fix it, right? He can do what he, he's gonna do what he's gonna do and he can fix it. What he's looking for is a group of people that just go, here, daddy, it's yours, it's yours. You know, um, I had a conversation with a friend and we were talking about how we miss being able to pick up the phone and call your dad. Um, I was talking to my brother about it and the inability to sort of be able to just to share because there's something about it when you call your dad, just something about it. And those of you who have lost your parent, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You just sometimes wanna pick up that phone and you wanna hear that voice because you know it's okay. And listen to me. Today, we call on God for our lives personally. Today, we call on God for West Cobb Church. And he hears, he responds, he's not gone. He's alive, he's alpha, omega, beginning, end, never leave, never forsake. And we don't have to wonder, we don't have to be aimless, we don't have to be misdirected, he hears. All we have to do, daddy, and make the call. Paul goes on and he says the difficulty of humanity in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11 and 12, he says the difficulty of humanity results in humility and maturity. I wanna read it to you, 2 Corinthians 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 11 and 12. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna read this to you. I have made a fool of myself, but you drove me to it. He's talking to, the, <laughs> he's talking to the people of the church. And he said, I ought to have been commended by you, for I am not in the least inferior to the super apostles, even though I am nothing. 
The things that mark an apostle, signs, wonders, miracles, were done among you with great perseverance. You know what Paul learned? Paul learned this, that in his difficulty and in his humanity, what was revealed that he was nothing, but that God was everything. The reason he was able to sustain through the division, persevere through the division, because he was mature enough to know and understand that it wasn't about him. Why do you have church splits? Why do you have division in the body of Christ? Why do you have broken relationships? Because we're often not mature enough to trust what God can do. And we think it's about what we can do. Paul is in emotional pain as we conclude. And he shares with them, in our state of brokenness, he makes us whole. In our state of meekness, his strength appears, God's strength appears. And in our state of weakness, his power, it is on display. This man in pain, this man rejected by people that he thought loved him. I thought we were a part of the same team. And it hurt Paul so much because it mattered. And what Paul reiterates, which we will find to the body of Christ, he he reiterates, in pain there is peace, in suffering there is strength, in weakness there is God's power. When you are attacked, he's your greatest defender. When you are weary, he can inspire you. In your humility, he is glorified. And in your despair, he is your hope. What Paul said was his life points to the God that he serves. Does yours? Do you as an individual believer live a life that points to the strength and the power of the God that we serve? As a body collectively in who we are, does it point to the God that we serve? And as we come together in the weeks ahead and the very purpose for having this unified service and coming together was so that we as a group could learn to build relationship together. And as I close today, I want you to think about this. Number one, don't hide our humanity. Over the next coming weeks, as we choose to connect, as we choose to come together. Don't hide our humanity as we build relationships. May we be real. May we be real. Because how do we learn, how are we motivated, and how are we inspired? We're inspired when we see that God can overcome. We're inspired when we see that God can change lives. And there's some of you that are in this room God has changed your life, and we need to know about it. There's some of you that are in this room. God has empowered you to overcome a great struggle, and we need to be real about it, and we need to know about it because it's going to be an encouragement. And don't hide your humanity because there's not one of us in this room that look good. We're not perfect. You know, I say this jokingly. You know why I like to dress good? And, I, and my, I like to have my hair fixed? And I panicked when it started to thin? I remember a moment when I was a kid and I was sitting on the dead end in our circle and I maybe was five years old and I remember this moment. And there were these girls that, yeah, and you're noticing them at five, you knew that they were not bad looking, right? And And I had been out playing all day. I probably had not taken a bath that day. I probably was relatively nasty, right? Because I I love the dirt. And they walked by and they said, you stink. And you know what? It's amazing the things that will stick with us. And I said from that day forward, that that will never be said. 
that will never be said. Humanity. There are people in this room, I say that jokingly, but there are people in this room that you try to hide beside, and you're not real about it. You know, why are you the way you are? There's a reason. We need to share. Be real about that. Be real about the humanity within you that God strengthened you to overcome and to deal with. Be real. Don't, number two, in these weeks ahead, as we connect, as we eat together, as, as we're part of these host parties that you're gonna hear more about as I close, don't deny your faults. Don't deny your faults. Don't deny your weaknesses. Don't deny your imperfections because it opens the door for God's strength to be on display. You understand that? If I'm just denying my fault, if I'm denying my weakness, if I'm denying my imperfections, then I'm trying to create this facade of something I'm not, I'm not and people don't get to see the real God in my real life. And listen, when people get to see the real God in your real life, there's the strength of God and the power of God that's on display. And man, that is a motivator and that is an encourager. And you and I, being human and being real, it matters. Because I need to know your story and you need to know my story. And then last, don't fear saying, I need help. I need help. Why? Because when you say, I need help, which the Apostle Paul did, it opens the door for the hope of Christ to be on display. When you say, I need help, I need prayer. You know, I remember as a young pastor, it was a different era. But if I, I, you would be shocked <laughs> at the end of the service and people would want me to pray for them, the things that they would share with me. It was a different era. People were willing to say, I'm human. People were willing to say, I'm weak. People were willing to say, I'm struggling. People were willing to say, I need help. And everything that the Apostle Paul outlines in the church at Corinth being misdirected, he points to them and goes, guys, we're not being real. We're not expressing our humanity so that the glory of God can be displayed. God is not on display because we're choosing to appear to be something that we're not. And church, here's the opportunity that you have. Number one, we have an at the table event today. You see these name tags that Laura put together? You see those name tags? That's for us to get to know each other. Some of us are here and we don't even know each other's name. And we've been going here for months or for years. Today, number one objective is get to get to know someone you don't know, name tag. And if you're shy, it's okay. We're gonna break out of it. We're gonna break out of it today. The second thing is this. Throughout the weeks ahead, we're gonna have what we call host or dinner parties. And I need people to sign up and say, I'm gonna be a host and I'm gonna invite people. And I don't care if you do it at your house. I don't care if you go to Longhorn, right? Because that's probably, if you go with me, that's probably where you're gonna go. I don't care where you go, I don't care how you do it, I don't care if you do it over breakfast, I don't care if you do it, I call it a dinner party, but whatever, right? We need people to say, yep, I want you to sign up, I will be a host, I'm gonna be a host. And then over the weeks ahead, we're gonna invite you, you're gonna be invited, and, and, and you're going to get to go, get, and get to know people that you're not in relationship with and start to build fellowship. I challenge you to step out because that's a face it and fix it moment because you got to make that step. And then from there, 
I challenge you to build relationship with someone one-on-one that you can be in accountability with. By the end of the summer, that you've got a relationship. And you know how this happens? Some of you are in here today and you like to shop. I guess you don't do that socially anymore though, it's all Amazon, right? So, yep, that's why those boxes come to my house. Now, some of you may be here today and you may be like to fish. Some of you may be here and you like to golf. Some of you may be here and you may be a Braves fan. Some of you may be here and you like to exercise. Then you're going to find commonalities, I promise you, and you're gonna develop relationship, but you got to move away from accepting it and you gotta face it and you gotta fix it. If we want God to do what God needs to do at West Cobb, it starts with us being in community at the table. Now, I share this with you. I saw my daughter, Taylor, who, when, when I walked off stage, you saw me kiss her on the cheek. I don't just, you know, <laughs> kiss anybody up here, right? So that was my daughter. Um, and so when Taylor and Spencer were in New York, they were at a church called C3. The church is several thousand people today. You know what it started with? A man and wife from Australia called to New York, knew no one. They go to their building and they start inviting people to dinner. And their church was built on what's called a dinner party. Six locations, several thousand people in a five to six year period, all built off of dinner parties, people getting connected. And I'll tell you this, if my daughter and son-in-law had not found C3 Church and been invited to a dinner party. And you're invited to a dinner party the moment you walk in the door. It's not optional, right? Come on, I'm gonna connect. Where do you live? I live in this borough. Then you're going to this dinner party. And I can tell you that they found community, they found fellowship, and they found service there in a city where they knew no one. And so... I believe that we as a church need to do the same. And people love food, and people love to be in communion around food, and let's start as a body getting connected. Should you be a host, I want you to think about it. I want you to pray about it. And I want you to volunteer, however that may be. There's gonna be things that are coming throughout the summer that you're gonna be invited to, like the men's event. The ladies have more to come. Pastor Todd and the family ministry is putting together things for the family. Pastor David in the student ministry is putting things together for the student ministry. And the challenge is this. We don't want to be passive. We don't want to be disconnected. We don't want to be going through the motions because what we do matters. It is life or death. It has eternal consequences. I challenge you to get involved and to be involved as we go through this summer and we connect at the table. The band's going to come in a moment and they're going to sing a song and it's called At the Table. Wonderful song. And I want you to listen to the words of that song and I want you to pray. While that song is being played, I want you to pray and to worship right where you are. And I want you to ask God to help you to step forward in faith, to be committed to being connected so that God can do what he desires to do through us and through this body to glorify Jesus. Let us pray together. Father, thank you for this time. God, I thank you for this day. God, I thank you for this group of people that came together here on the first Sunday of summer and said, I'm gonna participate in being connected and I'm gonna participate in being at the table. And Father, I pray that you will honor our commitment to facing our need to be connected, but being willing to step out and fix it. Father, I pray that relationships will be renewed 
I pray, God, that relationships that have been broken because of unforgiveness, God, I pray that you would deal with that today. It's the greatest hindrance often to moving forward in right relationship with others and you is unforgiveness. God, let us break the chains of unforgiveness today. Father, I thank you for your movement in this place, the freedom of your Holy Spirit. In the powerful name of Jesus, I pray. As they sing this song, I want you right where you are to think about the challenge that was issued today. Will you be a part of getting connected? Will you come to the table so that we can be the body of Christ that represents this good God and this Jesus Christ that we serve?
Thank you guys for being here today. And uh, I want to do just a few um, quick housekeeping matters uh, just so you guys are know exactly what to do. So parents, if you have your little ones that are uh, in preschool or class or whatever, go ahead and check them out and then we're going to eat together. So check them out. Everybody will go in and we'll, we'll eat together. Um, and then after that, the activities like the Nerf War and all the activities that our youth put together for us, and thank, uh, thanks David and the, and the youth for being committed to that, we'll have a break and we'll let everybody, we'll, we'll call, you know, Nerf War, I guess. Is that what you do? So, um, do you shout it out? Is that what you do? War! So, yeah. Um, now, then uh, just a couple of other things. In the lobby, we have... Um, we want to clean up our church roles. Um, you know, membership is a lot different, I guess, than it used to be, like where you really had this formal letter. But, but if you're a partner of the ministry and you're committed to West Cobb Church, we just want to make sure that we've got everybody's contact information because we're going to try to do some things in this connection to ensure that everyone has access and can actually get in touch with each other and build relationships. Okay. All right. Now, so there's, there's a there's a uh, joy is put out there. It's called decision record. So don't freak out about that. But it just it's making sure that we're not asking everybody to get saved again and you know and all that kind of stuff, right? So we're just personal information is there. We want to be in contact with you. And uh, so if you could you could do that. Um, and then also we wanted to let church know that the pastor search team has narrowed down their journey to uh, a single candidate and we're going to present that single candidate on June 20th in terms of giving you the ability to know who it is there's gonna be a website you can go get information videos read his story all of those things are gonna be made available to you uh, so that uh, you, you can get to familiar with this individual. And then there's a process after that that we have to present uh, uh, he and his family to the church uh, for vote. Um, but it's very important that we get these roles cleaned up because even with that, we've got voting that will have to occur on the pastor position, so on and so forth. And so we're just trying to make sure that we are clean and aligned with everything that we need to do uh, in cor correctly and in order. So, there's a lot of food out there, okay? I'm telling you. There's, uh, Bill Shoup, is he in here? Bill, how many pork butts do we have? Over 20? 22 pork butts, okay? Then, then there's fried chicken, okay? I kind of worried about that because I checked my blood pressure yesterday when I went into Publix and I'm, I'm a little up and I'm trying not to have to go back on that medicine, but I keep eating that way. Um, and so uh, there's, I, I mean, you name it, there's coleslaw, there, uh, there's uh, beans, there's cat, I mean, you, it's, it's all there. And, and there's plenty to be eaten. And so we need everybody to, we'll, we'll say a quick blessing. And I want to thank all of the people that were involved in putting this together. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, and, uh, you, you know, and, and, and I hate to, there, there's so many that were involved, but I, I do want to, I do want to note a couple of people. Uh, first, Diane Cannon did an overhaul in that kitchen. And when I tell you that it was, it was, it, it was a little shoddy, it was, a, it was, a, it had not been used in a while. And, it, and you, man, you can do a tour of the kitchen today if you'd like, right? But you have to wash dishes if you go in there, all right? Uh, she did an amazing job with that. Thank you to Diane. And then my wife, Angela, um, she, she does not like to be uh, presented in any way in public. So, but I thank her. She was, uh, and then there was just a group of ladies and all the men that cooked. Uh, it's just, it's been amazing. And so let's say the blessing and we'll make our way over to eat. Father, I thank you for today. 
I pray, God, that you will bless the food that we're about to receive. And more importantly, God, I pray that we'll use this time just to enjoy each other and get to know each other in Christ's name.